Well, good morning, fellowship. Man, what a joy and a blessing it is to be here with all of you, whether you're here in the worship center this morning or joining us in the chapel or online here at home and all across the world. It is just a blessing to be gathered together today. And uh, I also want to wish all the moms a happy Mother's Day today. Um, whether you're a mom of biological kids or adoptive kids or foster kids or spiritual kids and your discipleship of others, which is what parenting really is a picture of for us in an ultimate way. I know that uh, being a mom can mean a whole lot of love and a whole lot of sacrifice for sometimes what feels like a little bit of recognition and appreciation, right? And so we want to make sure that you know uh, that we appreciate all the love and the joy that you share and the way you do it with so much grace. Just the picture that you are, the sacrificial and oftentimes underappreciated love of God for his children and just how you do it in a way that helps us all see that tangible, real love in a human being made in his image. So thank you guys for that. And this week we are moving towards the final few sermons in the sermon series that we're in, walking through the book of Hebrews together that we're calling Radiant Savior. Radiant Savior. Looking at the ways that Jesus fulfills all the things that God has told the people of Israel they needed in an Old Testament era to draw near to him, to connect with him, to worship him, to come into his presence, to have a relationship with him. Whether it was the tabernacle or the temple, whether it was the high priests or the sacrifices, whether it was the covenants, we've seen over and over in this series that those things were created by God is what the book of Hebrews calls shadows, pictures of what's actually happening in the heavenly realm and has been for all eternity. Those things were meant to point us to God, but what the writer of Hebrews is showing us in this year, or we want to make much of Jesus in our hearts, is that he is God. The radiance of his glory, Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, the exact imprint of his nature. And then if we have Jesus, and, and all that it means in that we have all that we need to draw near to God and his throne of grace with confidence. No matter where we are in the world, even here in central Arkansas, we get to draw near to the throne and the grace of God because of who Jesus is and what he's done. No matter what the current state of the temple in Jerusalem looks like, no matter what ethnicity we're from, Jewish or not, no matter what sins we need forgiven, because of Jesus Christ, we have everything we need. And so now the writer of this letter to the Hebrew Christians back in that day, having established that Jesus is the fulfillment of these things in the first nine chapters, all of a sudden turns his attention in these final chapters, 10, 11, 12, and 13, to the practical implications of that in our life. If Jesus really is the, the purpose of all these things, if he really has fulfilled all these things, if he really is the better version of all these things in our relationship with God, then what, what does that mean for us? And so in chapter 10, a few weeks ago, we saw this writer encourage these believers to draw near to God with full assurance in their relationship with him. He said, you don't have to be insecure in your relationship with God, because Jesus has paid the penalty for every sin you could possibly commit. He is the ultimate sacrifice. One sin for all you have been sacrificed for, and you can draw near to him. He can usher you into the Holy of Holies where the heavenly father himself is your great high priest, something even the Old Testament Jews could never do. Only one person was allowed to go into that place once a year into the very presence of God where the Ark of the Covenant stood. Jesus is saying, I can hold your hand. You can come and be ushered into the throne room of God anytime you want with me at your side. And then, of course, last week in chapter 11, we saw the writer encouraging these people because Jesus has done what he's done, because he is who he is, walk in faith in that, believe in that, that he exists, that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Like all these heroes of the faith that you look to in the Old Testament have done, believing by faith that God will fulfill his promises in your life, no matter what it looks like in any given moment. And now today in chapter 12, we're going to take a look at another implication of the fact that Christ being our all in all, what it means to us, that he is the prize worth winning, worth running towards in this life and the next. So the first nine chapters really tell us all about who Christ is and what he's done. Chapters 10, 11, and 12 so far walking through this are, are, have told us, are going to tell us that, man, because of that we need to draw near to God with confidence. We need to believe by faith 
in who he is and what he's done. And today, don't give up. Don't give up on believing that God loves you desperately and that has done all this to give you the most beautiful gift, which is himself, and to show you what that looks like in this life that we're living. And even though we're going to look at some other parts of chapter 12 today, um, because, you know, really we're preaching through the whole chapter today, it's the first two verses that I'm going to focus on the most. Because they really are the outline to the rest of the chapter. The rest of the chapter just, just reiterates in more detail what these first two verses are saying. So let's look at it together. This is really is where all of our sermon today is going to come out of. He says, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, speaking about those people he mentioned in chapter 11, let's also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see the outline there in these two simple verses. He says, let us set aside every weight and sin. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. And then let us look to Jesus as our motivation, as our example, and as our ultimate prize in the end. The first thing he shows us here is that since Jesus has shown us how much he loves us by paying for every sin as the once and for all sacrifice, chapter nine and 10, and and because he secured for us a better promised land, a better rest than even the Jews have in the land of Israel in the heavenly places, that was chapter four, He says, therefore, let us also live by faith. First of all, laying aside every weight and every sin that holds us back from experiencing the abundant life God has for us in the here and now. Now, if you notice, the writer's gonna use this analogy of running a race in a stadium, in an arena. And of course, in that day and age, the Jews would have known exactly what he's talking about because they lived under Roman rule and before that under Greek rule and of course, you know, the, the Greeks are where we get the Olympic games from that we're going to experience this coming summer uh, again. They had perfected this whole competition, this whole ideas of these events competing with the best athletes against one another in these arenas where people would come and pack in in throngs. And so the writer of Hebrews here taking that picture that everyone knew well in the whole sports world. And, and, and he says, listen, everything you know about that is just a fallen, broken, worldly example of us worshiping something that really is meant to be a picture of our relationship with God. And so he points out what that means, what that looks like for us. And in relating our life to this race, this arena, where it talks about the people in Hebrews 11 being this this cloud of witnesses, right? The crowd up there cheering us on. And of course, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, like the emperor in the royal box who all the athletes are competing for his glory. That's Jesus in his royal box looking down on us as we live this life, run this race for him. The author here says, listen, it doesn't make any more sense for us to continue to live in sin, walk in sin, and to let these sinful things and the consequences of these sinful things weigh us down any more than it does an athlete trying to run the fastest race they possibly can, keeping their tracksuit on, right? In fact, the word he says there for lay aside literally is the Greek words, the picture of an athlete taking off their kind of tracksuit, taking off their warmups to get down to where they're ready to run with the least resistance possible. And so he's saying in the same way, don't, don't cling to these sinful habits and these things that weigh us down, these legalistic activities that are keeping us from running as fast as we can, as full as we can toward Jesus Christ, toward being conformed in his image. I mean, we know we watched the Olympics this summer in Paris that you're going to see swimmers, man, get down to their bathing suits and that have been created and all kinds of technology and all this crazy stuff to let them move through the water as fast as possible. They've done the research to get it down as slim as they can, as tight as they can, as light as they can, so they can win that race sometimes by a fraction of a second, right? You know, when you watch these runners run and they're going to wear the tightest, lightest clothes they possibly can that have been designed to help them cut through the wind so that nothing holds them back from even the slightest edge they can have on the person next to them to win that race. And that's what God here compares our sin to. 
and even other things that weigh us down. He said it's the same as us choosing to run a race with weights in our shoes or with our warm-ups still on that would slow you down as you try and run against the person next to you. He says in the same way you'd lay aside anything that slowed you down before you run a race, lay aside the things in your life that are hindering you from, from, from moving toward being conformed to the image of Christ as fast as you possibly can. And I want to speak to what some of those things are because I think for a lot of us, when we hear, man, lay aside every sin in your life, we, we tend to only think of the things we've heard our whole life in churches that are evil, right? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, those are the things, you stay away from those things, God's okay with you, right? Um, and so those are the things we naturally gravitate towards. We think, okay, yeah, he's telling me here to stay away from those bad things in the world so I can run as fast as I can toward Jesus. And I want to say, to be sure, that's part of what he's talking about. Those things will hinder you from experiencing the abundant life that Christ has for you. I mean, if you get addicted to a substance abuse problem, it's going to hinder you from experiencing the abundant life of Christ. It's hard to be full of the fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. You can't do those things if you're obsessed with just getting your next hit or finding your next drink or filling that craving in your life. In the same way, if you get addicted to something like sex, it's going to be hard to experience the abundant life that Christ has for you. He's offering you to be more like him. Because he tells us giving is better than receiving. Being selfless is actually going to bring you more joy than being selfish. And it's hard to be selfless and serve someone else when you only see them as an object to fulfill your physical desires. Not to mention all the other ways that we hurt others and hurt ourselves, those made in the image of God who he loves desperately as we gossip against one another and steal from one another and do all those sinful things that you think of when you read a passage like this. So yes, it absolutely is talking about those things, but it's talking about more than just those things, right? He says every sin and every weight that might hold you back. And I want us to remember when we think about this book, this letter, what specifically the author is trying to encourage these people with in the gospel. We've been talking about it for the last 11 weeks now, right? 12, 12 weeks now, what this author is saying to these people, their primary concern is that they can't ever be right with God again. Their primary concern is that because the temple's been destroyed, because they've been scattered and dispersed all over Asia Minor, because there's no sacrifices, no high priests happening in Jerusalem, how am I ever going to be right in my relationship with God? Again, how am I ever going to be forgiven? They're walking around feeling the weight of their sin and the guilt of not having it be paid for by a sacrifice in the temple. And I think that's one of the primary things the author is trying to encourage them, even in this moment, what we're talking about. See, because all of us struggle with sin and with being addicted to sin, because sin is inherently addictive. At the same time, though, I think if all of us are being honest in here, we also all struggle with the guilt of our sin and the shame of our sin and how that weighs us down in our relationship with God. Now, I think what the writer here is getting at is not only shed those habits and those things that are holding you back from becoming more Christ-like, but also he's saying, stop wasting your time wallowing in your guilt because Jesus has paid it all. He's the once and for all sacrifice, chapters nine and 10, for the sins of the world. He has paid for it. Whether it's happening in Jerusalem or not, he has paid for it and you are free from that. You are forgiven from that. Uh, thinking about the origin of sin even. It goes all the way back to Genesis, all the way back to God's relationship with Cain and the story of Cain and Abel, because that was Cain's issue, wasn't it? Wrestling with the guilt over his sin. He had bought a worse sacrifice than Abel. God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice. It says Cain's sacrifice had, I guess, pride involved in it, selfishness in it, holding back in it. Um, in the midst of his relationship with God. And so Cain's all dejected. He's all downfall. He's jealous of his brother and kind of how God's pleased with him. And, 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 and maybe he didn't quite do what he, what he could have done. So he's feeling this un, 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 unequal weight. And what does God come to him and say to Cain? He says, Cain, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? He says, if you do well, won't you be accepted? And if you don't do well, since crouching at your door, it's desirous for you, but you must rule over it. 
What's fascinating to me about what God says to Cain here is not only what he says, but what he doesn't say. That sometimes I think we misinterpret in our relationship with God that brings us to some pretty unhealthy places in our relationship with God. If you notice what he doesn't say, he doesn't say, that's right, Cain, you messed up with me, so your face better be fallen and your countenance better be down and you better wallow in it and you better feel guilt and shame. And maybe in a couple of weeks, if I see enough contrition from you, then maybe we can be okay again. Does he say that? No, in fact, that's what he's worried about with Cain. He's saying, Cain, listen, I know that you did something that you're not proud of. And I know you're jealous of your brother and what he did that feels really, really good. Listen, you're going to have to get over it. You're going to have to believe that I love you, that I forgive you, that I want to walk with you, that I want to have a relationship with you. That's why he says, if you just start doing what you know I love with me, if you start doing what you know is right and what's best, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. If you'll accept my forgiveness, accept my grace, not wallow in your guilt, it, 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 it'll be fine. Just start walking with me again. But then what's interesting is he says, but if you don't, and here's what I love about this. He doesn't say, but if you don't, I'm gonna really be mad at you. Right, what does he say? He says, but if you don't, if you don't accept my love and forgiveness and grace to you, What's going to happen? He says, sin's crouching at your door. It's desires for you. If you don't believe that I love you and have forgiven you and just start walking with me again in this beautiful relationship we can have, guess what? Your sin's going to take you over. And sure enough, we see that's what happens to Cain. He can't forgive himself. He can't accept God's forgiveness. And so he stews and he stews over how his brother is the reason why he feels bad. His brother is the reason why he can't be okay anymore. And so his conclusion is, I guess I got to get rid of my brother. If I get rid of him, then there's no shining example of perfection out there that's making me feel bad about myself anymore. That's what God warns them about. It's the weight of his sins, this guilt and this shame that leads him to sin more and more and more, which is so true in our life, isn't it? The, the, the more guilt that we wallow in doesn't produce the fruit of the spirit in our lives. It doesn't make us excited to wake up and walk with God and love God more. Satan actually tries to use that to make us feel that sense of, man, I'm such a loser. Why even try? I mean, he already, he, he already hates me. I've already messed up way more than this person over here. No matter how much good I do in my relationship with God moving forward, they've, they've already, they already have a lead on me in this race of, of life. They're already beating me. There's no way I can ever catch up to them, so I may as well just quit. I may as well stop. Satan would love for you to feel useless, worthless, so far gone you could never please God or be in a pleasing relationship with him again. No, guilt doesn't lead us to holiness, church. Grace leads us to holiness. Forgiveness leads us to holiness. So the writer of Hebrews here is telling us to cast off that sin that weighs us down from experiencing the abundant life we have in Christ as well as the guilt of our sin that weighs us down and keeps us from experiencing the abundant life of Christ, which is why in verses three through 11, like I said, that verse one, two, the main point, but the rest of it comes back and explains in more detail what it is he's saying. That's why three through 11 says what it says, that, that, that God's training us like an athlete through our hardship, through his loving discipline, like a parent who loves a child. It's not about wrath and judgment. It's about discipline and training toward holiness because he loves you. Look, it says, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. So that you may not grow weary or faint hearted in your struggle against sin. Have you not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood? He says, like Christ has, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? He says, my son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. And look what he says, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. He says, it's for discipline that you have to endure. God's treating you as sons for what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? If you left without discipline, if you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time to seem best to them. He disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields, and don't forget this phrase, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Why does God ask us to resist sin? Because he loves us. 
Why do we feel the negative consequences of in our lives every time we keep living in it and going back to that well? Because he loves us. For our good, he says, so that we may share in his holiness. He's actually offering you something that's so desirable, so amazing. He said, I'm willing to share the joy of being holy with you if you'll just pursue it with me. Because he loves us for our good. Because holiness is best for us. Because through every trial and tribulation, God's teaching us more and more how to let go of sin, how futile it is, how, how, how unhelpful it is, how, how destructive it is, and embrace his love and forgiveness of us so that we may experience the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Because that's what righteousness does for us. It brings us that peace that we all long for, that peace that surpasses all human understanding, that peace that every one of us in here feels like, man, I just wish I could just rest from all the emotions and anxieties and fears and all the ways I feel like I'm letting everyone down, doing all these things. And he says, listen, that's what righteousness is about. That's what holiness is about. If you feel like trying to be more like Christ, if you feel like trying to be more holy is making you more anxious and more kind of uh, feel bad about yourself and more competitive, then you're you're, you're not getting it. You're not, you're not, you're not pursuing it for what the purpose of it is. It's to be able to rest in the joy of letting go of sin and letting go of sin and letting go of sin that just destroys and experience life and joy and hope and peace and love and all the things we'd put on a bumper sticker and tell anyone is awesome. That's what it is. That's what it is. That peace that we're safe under his protection, no matter what's going on in our lives, that peace that we have enough and don't need more because we have him, that peace that we're getting the most out of our lives, even when it feels like we're not because he is with us and he's walking through it with us, that peaceful fruit of righteousness. Which is why he says the second thing that he says to us in chapter and verse one, that not only are we to lay aside every sin, every weight, everything slowing us down as we try and run this race, but then he says, you actually got to run the race. He says, run the race with endurance that God set before you to lead you to abundant life. And there's three things in this simple phrase that he says in verse one that are really powerful to me and jump off the page where he says, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. First, he says, let us run. Let us run the race. See, I would argue this, one of the reasons why we continually struggle with our sin, one of the reasons why we keep going back to that well over and over again to the things that we're addicted to in our lives that that aren't Jesus, that we're trying to find life in that instead of in him, uh, nine times out of 10, it's because we're not trying to run the race God's put in front of us. We're trying to stop sinning, but that's like sitting around trying to kind of lose weight and get as light as you can and be as fast as you can without actually running. It's kind of hard to train for a race if you don't run, isn't it? I mean, you can do all kinds of things to try and make yourself better in all these other ways, but if you're not running, you're not really moving toward the goal of what you're trying to do. You can try and get rid of everything that weighs you down, but but you're gonna have to run. You're gonna have to train if you're gonna end up doing that. Because here's the challenge. If we're not running the race God's put in front of us to run as Christians in this life, guess what? The tracksuit feels pretty good. It's pretty comfy. Keeps us warm. I mean, if the whole goal of our life is just to sit in the stands and watch, then yeah, I'll I'll probably take the tracksuit. But if I'm trying to run as fast as I can and train as fast as I can to to win this race, I'm going to take the tracksuit off, get down the track, and I'm going to start to practice. When I'm running the race he's put before me, now I want to get rid of everything in my life slowing me down towards Christ-likeness. I want to get rid of everything in my life that's holding me back from experiencing more of his holiness because I'm experiencing the joy of it and the peace of it and the peaceful fruit of righteousness in it and I'm experiencing the benefit of it. I'm saying, give me more of that. Let me shed more. Let me get rid of more sin so I can pursue him even more. It motivates you more when you run the race. If you're just trying to avoid the bad things, man, that's a struggle and a fight that is impossible. You've got to replace it with a positive pursuit in your life of Christ. You've got to move towards something, not just away from something. Which is why here at Fellowship, we would say, man, when you're involved in a healthy D group or you're, you're getting together with people to pray and to study the word and to serve each other and to love each other and to bear one another's burdens the way the scripture talks about, guess what you have less time and energy for? Sin. You have less time for it. You have less energy for it. You have less of a desire for it when you're running the race God's put in front of you. 
Listen, when you serve the church body here on a Sunday morning, when you serve with one of our local partners in the community of Central Arkansas, when you help mentor and teach kids to read who desperately need it here in Central Arkansas, when you come alongside and minister to prisoners like we've talked about this last year, when you serve on a serve day like we just did recently, so many of you've experienced that joy of serving because giving's, giving's better than receiving. Guess what you have less time for? Sin, guess what you have less energy for? Sin, guess what you don't crave as much? Sin, because you're experiencing the joy, the peaceful fruit of righteousness in your life and it's motivating you to want to run faster and farther and to keep going because it's so life-giving. We'll never experience the victory Jesus wants to experience in him in this life if we just sit around and try to stop the bad things any more than you're gonna win a race if you just try and shed as much weight as you can and get rid of as much excess clothing as you can to try and be faster without actually running. You got to actually put one foot in front of the other and practice the thing that you're training for. And church, here's what the scripture says. What we're training for is to be more like Christ. That's what this whole life is about because that's what heaven is. It says when we see him, we'll be like him and that will blow your mind with how perfect it'll be. What you're going to experience, the perfect joy you're going to experience, all the things you can't wait to get to to experience in heaven, what it is, is being exactly like Jesus. And he says, guess what? You can start to taste as much of that as you want right now if you'll start training with me. If you'll start shedding these things that are holding you back and start pursuing these things that I pursued when I was down here, if you'll start walking in my footsteps, you're going to experience so much of what heaven is. It's going to be crazy. You want heaven on earth? It's not in all the stuff that we think it is. It's in being more like him each and every day. But the second thing that he says in this phrase that's so powerful to me, not only does it say, hey, you gotta run the race, you can't just avoid the bad stuff, you gotta pursue the good stuff, but he says, notice, run the race with endurance. With endurance. Here's the bad news about what this verse says. The race we're running in a 100-yard sprint. It's a marathon. It's a long one. And that's why he spent the whole last chapter in chapter 11 showing us the importance of those who've lived by faith before us, right? Why? Because Abraham and Sarah had to trust God for 25 years before Isaac was born. He promised them Isaac, 25 years later, Isaac's born, right? That's a long time. That's a marathon. That's not a sprint. Moses had to lead the people through the wilderness for 40 years. A journey that should have taken a couple of weeks. They wander for 40 years in the desert. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Listen, the journey God has you on that's going to end with you being the most Christ-like and him getting the most glory and the people watching you being blown away by, by what God's done in your life that makes them want to do it with him too. That journey takes time. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not a hundred yard dash which is why he paints that picture of the Abrahams and the Sarahs in the crowd cheering you on as you run this race, as you run this life. They're out there saying, listen, we waited for decades to see God's promise come true in our lives. And listen, here's what I want you to know, Christian. It was the waiting that produced the Christ likeness in my life. It was the trying to speed it up on my own timeline by telling Abraham to go sleep with Hagar that produced Ishmael and making us realize, oh wait, that was a terrible idea. That's part of what produced the Christ likeness. It was me not being willing to wait and watching him even redeem and utilize that in my life. It was the waiting that brings Abraham finally to the place that when God says, hey, this promised child I finally gave you, take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. It's, it's, it's the reason why Abraham can, can look at that moment and look at his servants down there at the bottom of the mountain and say, me and the child are going up and we will come back to you. It's why when they're marching up the mountain and Isaac says, I see the fire and I see the wood, but where's the ram? Abraham says, God's gonna provide the ram for himself. Where does that faith come from? Where's that peace come from? He's not anxious, he's not stressed, he's not worried about it at all. The New Testament says even that that when Abraham lifted the knife up, he believed that even if he plunged it down into Isaac's chest, God would bring him back from the dead. That's how convinced he was that God's promise was going to come true in his life, even though it looked ridiculous, even though it looked like the opposite. Where does that faith come from? It comes from the waiting. It comes from trying to speed it up and do things on your own and live in sin that you see over and over again doesn't work. It comes from finally trusting God. God's plan for you, his race for you, his love for you, his forgiveness for you, his grace for you. 
And that's why that cloud of witnesses is up there yelling. You can do it. Keep going. Don't give up. I know it's hard, but, but it's, it's going to produce the peaceful fruit of righteousness in you in a way that God is so excited about. Just keep running. Keep running. But the third thing that's so key in this phrase in verse one to me, when God tells us to run the race and then he says that is set before us. Set before us. And the author here using the collective we and us in these verses, but there's a sense in which this phrase he's saying, listen, each of us has a race God set before us. Let us run the race that's set before each one of us. Listen, one of the reasons that we're all tempted to get discouraged is God takes us on our individual journeys in this life to conform us to his image and to glorify himself the most is because if we're being honest, we start looking around at other people's races, don't we? And we say, man, it sure would be nice to have that race instead of my race. I'd love to trade my race for your race. I mean, man, their race seems so much easier than mine. I wish, I, why, why did God put these obstacles in front of me and they just seem to be breezing along over, uh, uh, over there. And here's the reality of it. When we say, I don't want to run my race, I want their race. Their race looks easier than my, better than my race, more fun than my race. If all of us are forgiven, God, if you love us all the same, if all our sins are forgiven, that's not what this is about, then why do I have to run the race I have? Here's what I'd encourage you with. First of all, if you actually switched your race with someone else's race, it'd take you about a week and a half to say, yeah, I don't want this race either. See, part of the challenge is we only get the Instagram version of all of our races, don't we? Right? We only post the happy moments when the sun is shining or we're in the shade or we're drinking the water at the table or whatever it is. That's what we share about our race. What we don't share is the moments where we're puking on the side of the road, where we've tripped and fallen and skinned our knee, where we're limping along, where we think we're starting to see the tunnel vision and we're going to pass out. We, we only see the highlights of each other's race. And we think, man, I wish I had that race. If you got involved in that person's race, I guarantee you real fast, you'd be like, I don't know if my race is better than their race, but it's sure not worse. So that's the first thing that I would say. In a fallen, broken world, you need to know everyone's race is hard. Everyone's race is tough because fallen, broken people being conformed into the image of Christ and learning to let go of our sin and trust him is always hard. And he's doing it in different people's lives in different ways, but he's accomplishing the same goal and it's always a struggle. That's why he talked about discipline for eight verses. He's disciplining us out of love to train us for what he wants us to experience because he loves us. But that training, everyone's going through it. Everyone's going through that discipline. Everyone's doing it. No one's getting to skate by. No one gets a free pass. That's one thing that discourages us. And he's encouraging us to run the race put before us. But the second reason why I say we need to focus on running the race put before us and don't worry about trading with someone else's race is because God has a very specific joy he wants you to experience when you cross your finish line. He made you in his image. He loves you. He knows every hair on your head. And he knows that when you get to the finish line of your race that he's asking you to run, it's gonna mean more to you than it will to anyone else on the planet. You could run someone else's race and cross the finish line and there'd be some joy there, but it wouldn't be as much joy as if you finished your race because he loves you and he has you on that path for a reason. He cares about you. He knows that specific joy he has waiting for you at the end of the finish line. It's gonna mean more to you than it will to anyone else when you get there. That's why back in chapter 11 last week, we saw him talk about the importance of faith because listen, that statement I just made right there, it takes faith. It takes a ton of faith to believe that when you're going through the hardest moments of your life. It's why he says back in chapter 11, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You're not gonna be able to do this without faith. Why? Because, and he tells what faith is. He says, because what faith is, is you gotta believe two things. You gotta believe he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. You gotta believe he's real, which Satan's trying to discourage you every day to say, man, he's not real. This is just a bunch of random stuff happening in your life. The kind of world's just spinning on its axis because the big bang happened and just is. And just stuff that happens, happens and there's no rhyme or reason to it. So just do whatever you gotta do to make the best out of your life. Don't worry about the consequences or anybody else because he's not real. It's the first thing Satan tries to break you down. So he says, if you're gonna have faith and walk through this in a way that's gonna be meaningful, you've gotta believe he exists. But the second thing you gotta believe is that as you seek him and pursue him, he will reward you. That joy at the end of your race is real. And he's so excited standing there with open arms just past the finish line waiting to embrace you 
knowing, man, when you finish this, just like anything you discipline and train for, it's hard, it's tough, it's a challenge. But when you cross that finish line, you feel so good about yourself. You're so excited about it. You, I mean, and he's saying, I've got a joy for you that no one else will experience. It's perfect for you. I've built you for this race. I've made you for this race. It's where the scripture talks about this idea of he gives measures of grace to different people in different ways. Why? Because he's asking you to run a certain grace. He's a certain amount of grace and he's giving that to you in a certain way to run. He's built you for your race. And there's a joy there that only you can experience when you run it. Noah's race was different than Rahab's race, which is different than Enoch's race, which was different than Esther's race and Ruth's race and Gideon's race. They weren't the same. They produced the same joy in the end, but they weren't the same. And before I move on from this point, I need to say something else about this idea that we all have a race set before us that is somewhat unique. It all ends with us loving Jesus and being conformed to his image. So in that regard, we all get the same thing, but it's a unique joy we experience as we walk through it. I need to say something about that before I move on, because one of the worst things we do to each other in the church and honestly outside of the church is we judge other people's races. We judge how fast they're running their race. We judge what kind of race they have. And if we're being honest, we start to judge the reason why their race looks the way it does. If we're being honest, sometimes we do kind of think our race is better than someone else's race. And we'll say, oh man, I hate their race. That race looks so hard. I'm gonna pray for them. And I'll say this, if that's a sincere thing, great. People need prayer and they need your compassion. That's wonderful. What happens a lot of times though is what gets unsaid or unspoken, what we're really feeling in our self-righteous heart at times is, man, I'm real sorry for their race and I'm sure glad I don't have it. And kind of deep down, I'm wondering what they did that gave them that race. What did they do or not do that made God say, this is your race? Because it kind of feels like punishment and wrath for something wrong and I'm sure thankful I don't have that race. If we're not careful, we end up like the Pharisee that Jesus talked about whose prayer to God was, God, I thank you I'm not like other people. And Jesus isn't impressed with that prayer, right? The prayer of God, thank you so much for blessing me because I've made better choices because I'm not like other people. What does he say? He says, no, the prayer God hears is the tax collector on his knees saying, have mercy on me. Thanks again for listening to the word of God. I'm getting right now when it comes to a negative way, God, have mercy on me, have grace on me, pour it out on me because I'll take all you can get because I don't deserve anything. He said, that's the prayer God hears is when you realize that your race is not because of your actions the way that we think it is. It's the reason why when Jesus' disciples came to him and saw this blind man and they said, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, right? They're saying, hey, that guy's race looks pretty hard. He's blind. What's the reason why he has to run that race? Is it because he sinned or his parents? I love what Jesus says. He says, neither. I mean, everyone sinned. He said, if that's what it's about, you'd all be blind, Right? But what does he say? He says, no, he says, this man's this way so the works of God might be displayed in him. He said, God wants to display certain works through his life in his race in a certain way that he's not asking you to. That's fine, but don't judge him for his race. Don't act like it's because you made better choices than him that he has his race and you have your race. That's chapter nine. Jesus once and for all sacrifice forgave everyone's sins for all time. So it's not because of your sin. That's wrath and punishment. God's saying he's disciplining us as children because he loves us, but it's, it's, it's not what we make it out to be. And it makes it so hard at times in the church to not only run your race, but to talk to people about your race, to share your race, to get help for your race because we're all scared to death. Someone's gonna say, oh man, I'm so sorry that's happening to you. What'd they do? What'd they not do? that gave them that race. Now the journey we're on is not about our punishment. It's about our holiness. It's about our joy, which is why verse two doesn't tell us to look to the left or to the right, to the other people around us looking at a different race. What does he say? He says, look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross of all things despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I mean, if anyone had a reason to want to trade races with somebody, it would have been Jesus, wouldn't it? You talk about someone that got a bad rap down here. 
Okay, guys, so wait a minute. You're saying my race in this life for 33 years is gonna be to live perfectly, obey you perfectly, experience the joy and the peaceful fruit of righteousness perfectly in my relationship with you and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna do that perfectly. And my race is that I gotta suffer the most horrible crucifixion and death in, 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 in the in, in entire world for the people that are killing me. That's my race. And not, not only that, not only for those people, but for the sins of the entire world, past, present, future, the weight of the entire world. That's my race. No, I think I'll take Ben's. Thanks. His is rough, but it's not that rough. No, if anyone had a right to trade races and to want to trade races, it would have been Jesus. And yet, what does it say? It says he endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. He said, listen, I know the joy that my heavenly father has for me when I finish my race is gonna be so perfect and so much better than if I avoided my race. I'm walking straight into it with faith, faith that he exists and he's a rewarder of those who seek him. And that's why he said on the cross, into thy hands I commit my spirit. I'm trusting you as I breathe my last. I'm trusting you. And it says, you see at the right hand of the father, glory upon glory. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He has the name above every other names. Why? Because he ran his race and he finished his race and he trusted God in the process. And that's what he has for you. That's what he has for me. It's what he has for all of us. And here's the encouragement that the writer gives us. He says, not only is he the author, the founder of your faith, of your journey, but he's the perfecter of it. What does that mean? That means if you cling to Christ, he's gonna hold on to your hand through every step of your race and he's gonna bring you to the finish line. Even if you pass out, he'll pick you up and carry you. Even if you can't do it anymore, he'll hold your hand and walk with you. Even if you get lost, he'll get you back on the course. He is the author and the perfecter of it. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He will get you across the line no matter how impossible it feels, no matter how hard it seems. He's the ultimate example. He's the ultimate motivation. And he's the ultimate prize at the end of the race. Because like we said, the whole race is about being conformed to his image. What you get when you finish is him. All of him, unfiltered, unhindered by sin, all of it. And it's gonna be so glorious, you won't even be able to stand how incredible it is. So for that joy set before us, run our race with endurance and trust him that he has a perfect plan for that. And listen, I just want to encourage us here as, as, as we close to do this, because if we're being honest with ourselves, we, we, we endure a whole lot of hardship down here on the earth for a whole lot of less exciting things, if we're being honest with ourselves. We, some of us love to compete and do all that. We'll train and kill our bodies and suffer to win ribbons and prizes and trophies that end up in boxes in our attic collecting dust. We'll, 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 we'll suffer and spend tons of money and tons of time trying to get the perfect concert ticket online and we'll sit there and hit refresh a million times or we'll wait in line for hours and hours to go to a show we're not gonna remember a year from now. We sacrifice everything to buy houses and cars and clothes and experiences and all these things. They're gonna wear out, break down, or we're gonna have to replace. They're gonna be outdated in a couple years anyway. We suffer so much for temporary things in this life that don't ultimately matter. He's saying, listen, I know the training is hard. I know the discipline is tough, but the reward you're gonna get in Christ when you cross that finish line in heaven, it's so much better than all the things we sacrifice and suffer for down here. It's so much more worth it. It's so much better. The story he's written for you is beautiful. He's the author and perfecter of your faith. It's perfect for you what he's written for you, whether it feels like it or not. So look to the cross and look to the empty grave and believe through all the little deaths that we die to ourselves in this life, right? Because sometimes our journey is so hard. We're dying all these little deaths every day in our journey to try and get us to let go of sin and be conformed to his image. But here's what we don't realize. Every little death you die in your life that's hard, guess what? You're also experiencing a little resurrection. He's changing you. He's conforming to his image. He's growing you. He's maturing you. He's beginning to show you what peace looks like in this life apart from sin Every little death brings a little resurrection and you can't have resurrection without death. And so I know it's hard, but you need to believe and understand that. Everything you're suffering is gonna bring with it a new life that's gonna be better than if the death didn't happen. That's the impossible thing to believe that he's called us to believe. Some of you know I have a man crush on the band U2 because their lyrics are just, they're great. Um, The way they wrestle with faith and the scriptures and things. I know it doesn't always seem or sound Christian, but it's really, really deep. 
Uh, let me read to you the lyrics from a song called Breathe that speak to this exact reality. They say this, every day I die again and again and reborn. Every day I have to find the courage to walk out into the street. With my arms out, I've got a love you can't defeat. I won't be down or out because there's nothing you have that I need so I can breathe, right? That peaceful fruit of righteousness. I can breathe because there's nothing the world has that I need. And if I'm willing to die to myself a little bit every day over and over and over again, I experience the little mini resurrections over and over and over again. I have this love that you can't defeat and I can breathe. And then they end the song by saying, I found grace inside of sound. I found grace, it's all I found. And I can breathe. I can breathe because the only thing I'm clinging to is grace. The grace of God that loves me, that's forgiven me, that knows me, and that is bringing me by grace on a journey to the end of it that's gonna result in the most glorious joy I've ever experienced in my life. It's a peaceful fruit of righteousness from Hebrews 12. Trusting that his righteousness is best for us if we let go of sin, we can breathe. Trusting that his righteousness has been given to us as a gift and if we accept it and receive it and get rid of our guilt from our sin and believe he's forgiven us, we can breathe. In trusting the race he set before us, it will end in the joy that he knew the cross would end in for him. We can endure whatever we're walking through with hope and we can breathe. I need that in my life. Maybe you do too. I hope this encourages you today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for your words to us. God, we thank you for Hebrews and for what it's telling not just Hebrew Christians 2,000 years ago that can seem like, what is this going to have to do with my life as a Gentile believer here in Arkansas in 2024, and yet it is so perfect for me. Thank you for that. Lord, I beg you that we wouldn't just hear these words today, we would believe them. We would trust in your race for us. We would run it with endurance. We would look to the joy set before us. And Lord, we would experience that joy each and every day, a little more and a little more. We ask in your name, amen. Thanks again for listening to the Word of God. We are blessed to reach you throughout the week through whatever platform you're listening on. If you're needing prayer or you want to talk to someone about your walk with Jesus, reach out to us at fellowshipar.com slash contact. Have a great week.